doctor, uh, she then being 52 and he being 38, um, and they fell into rapturous love. Um, her friends told her, oh my God, you know, you'll just, you'll tear yourself up being with somebody that young. And uh, well, five years later, they're still together. Um, they don't have a child together. They have a hanger together. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, you know, um, Carlene is very uh, rational about this. She says that if, this, if it only lasts as long as this, it will be a wonderful period of my life. Um, but Walt says he doesn't ever want it to end. And of course, if and when it does end, she will still have her passion. That's the important thing. Um, the, the, um, this kind of runs into the boldness to dream, because she certainly had the boldness to dream, and to dream how this um, could be pursued uh, for the rest of her life. And I think Carl Sandburg had a wonderful line, it was, nothing happens unless first a dream. And I did find in my interviews that women routinely describe a kind of aha moment, sometime maybe late 40s or 50s or later. Um, I don't have a new dream. Uh, and it's more than a search for a new hobby. Uh, it's truly a, a new concept of yourself in the world. What is possible for you to do with your unique package of talents and uh, connections uh, and appetites? And a good way to start is to ask yourself, what surprised you lately? And if the answer is, well, not much of anything, um, then it's time to put yourself in a challenging situation, an unfamiliar situation, out of your comfort zone, and preferably one with a little danger. If, it, if not physical danger, or then danger of embarrassment, danger of failing, danger of looking foolish, because we all are more concerned about that as we get older and we want to be the experts, we want to be the authorities we're looked to for the, that role. But being a learner again, uh, as Carlene was, uh, or being a learner by going back to finish your uh, dissertation, uh, or starting a new business, uh, or learning almost any, or relearning almost any skill uh, that you used to love to do, um, puts you in that situation. And what happens when you, when you put yourself in a challenging situation, particularly one with a little danger, your neurons really fire up and you make all kinds of neurotransmitter connections, and that leads you to other possibilities. And also, when you get feedback for having pursued this dream, or this passion, uh, this new challenge, uh, for doing it well, you then take a leap in confidence, and that confidence then builds on itself for you to do other things. <clears throat> um, so many of the stories, and in and out is exactly the way I, I mean that, literally. Um, it's it's the, the, the figure who reawakens um, uh, an unattached woman's um, appetite for, for sex and sense of her womanliness, as, uh, as my interviewer he said. Um, he's usually not, he's a transitory figure. He's usually not a keeper, uh, at, but very often a woman later, after the little heartbreak is over, celebrates his role in her life. As a matter of fact, one of my New Jersey interviewees gave a marvelous example of this. Um, she was divorced in her 20s, and she had a son, 
she just concentrated almost exclusively on taking care of her son and building her uh, career possibilities so that she became indispensable. She was the manager of a large, diverse um, health practice. Um, so there she was in her mid-40s. She goes to mass with her mother. And all of a sudden, she says to her mother, the priest is really cute. He's turning me <laughs> on. And it was, oh, Carol, yeah, please. Uh, but she realized that she was ready. So she <laughs> started, um, didn't attack the priest, but she got her uh, son to teach her how to use the internet. And she began going into chat rooms because they didn't even have uh, dating services yet. Well, she met a man online. She was quite interested in him and vice versa. Uh, and he pressed her to send a picture. Well, she wouldn't do it. She wouldn't meet with him. Finally said, what's going on? And she said, I'm too big. She was about probably 75 pounds over her standard weight. Uh, well, he wrote back saying, I'm big. My deceased wife was big. I like big. <laughs> Me big. She did. And they fell into this wonderful uh, love affair. And he was very much like her first husband, but this time it worked. And then she, you know, put all of her repressed desires for a family life and a new husband on this man. So after six months, it dissolved. And she got went through a little heartbreak. And then she said, I realized that he, the universe sent me exactly what I needed. He got me out of myself, out of the house, on, online. And she said, and then, I realized that the internet is like a candy jar full of men. You just <laughs> unwrap one, unwrap another one. Uh, well, um, after several years of uh, updating, uh, a, a great tragedy uh, in her life, uh, one of the tragedies that I think most women can't recover from, uh, her only son died of a brain aneurysm. And who came to the wake and the funeral and supported her for the next months after that were three of her former loves from the internet, including the man that she had been in love with. So one of the, one of the recurring uh, stories I hear from women who finally get up the nerve to really use the internet and stay with it uh, is they make friends. They make friends with men that they probably would otherwise never have met because they aren't in their work life or their neighborhood. And that expands their, um, their whole sense of a universe that is open to them and also uh, educates them and gives them you know, more to talk about with the next candy they unwrap. <laughs> I copy that, you know, women who, who do read the book, um, that they just don't think that sex and being a seasoned woman only occurs when you're divorced. The saddest thing I, for me, too, is that I see this as couples as my friends are getting older, too, and their children are leaving, that they do find themselves at those crossroads. And, uh, and, and you know, I see them, I love them dearly, and I don't want them just to kind of give up because it's easy. You know, you want them to, to rediscover. I think that everybody who drops the last child off to college ought to go right off on a vacation together to a really nice romantic spot. This is a very classic key moment. And is it can be just about you and him again. Why don't you go to the counter of a restaurant, or to a bar, and, and pretend to pick each other up? And, and see what happens, you know, what would you say to each other about who you are and what matters to you. And, um, you know, I think that, that we, we need to not come jaded. Man, I know what you're thinking and what you're feeling. And yeah. we, we don't. We really don't. We barely know ourselves from moment to moment. Uh, okay, this is another very important phase. Um, but I got you no you know. Um, yeah, it, it means something. Uh, but then uh, once once I made the decision, it wasn't a very hard decision to make because I was already there. I had to learn how to do things alone. That's what I did. Yeah. Um, that's, the, that's the most fun part. 
but that's the most fun part. Um, the scary part was going, oh my god, I'm going to a restaurant and they're going to sit me at a table for two and it's going to be empty. But those bars are seats for one and so they sit you there, you sit there, and everyone else is a single. And the conversation, you turn to the partner and go, ooh, what do you have? You know, and you don't, there's not that um, hesitancy or, or nervousness or you're just, I'm curious, I'm here to eat. I'm curious about what you're eating. And so that starts up conversations, very relaxed. Um, and um, by the end of the evening, you might have, you know, a date. Uh, the next phase, um, I call, as well the stream, we're a little behind here. Um, oh, here we go. I have a lot of this big friends. Marlene, the summer. I'm so full of being. I think it was a job. Yeah. 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 Y
last phase of pursuing the passionate life as I was able to derive from my interviewees, I, I came to call graduating to grand love. And that really is kind of the, the pot of gold at the end of the arc. This is the the ultimately ripe peach. You know, the peach that you, you know, put into a gorgeous glistening cobbler. <laughs> Uh, okay, I have to tell you about these folks. Um, the, um, I wanted to end the book with a centenarian. Um, so I called the New England Centenarian Study at Harvard <clears throat> and asked if I could put a couple of questions at the end of the protocol they use for their um, subjects. Um, they said, well, we don't ask about sex and love. Um, so the next day, the director called me and said, you know, I'm kind of ashamed that we don't ask about sex and love, but um, I can't tell you this as the director of the New England Centenarian Study, but I can tell you as a grandson that I know a 95-year-old woman who is having a passionate love affair. And he introduced me to his grandmother, uh, <clears throat> Catherine Pennington, uh, 95 years old. She lives in a, an independent living home called Freedom Village. <laughs> so we all end up there. <laughs> and, and so I flew down to Florida, and I uh, was met at the airport by the van driver who said, are you meeting someone special? And I said, oh yes, someone very special, a 95-year-old lady who uh, is in love with an 89-year-old man. And he said, that's it, they always go for the younger man. <laughs> So I went to the home and uh, called from the lobby and said, Catherine, uh, can we have, can I invite you to lunch? And she said, oh, I'd love to come to lunch with you. I have a special friend, may I bring him? And I said, I would be delighted if you brought Walt. So, I mean, Ward. Uh, so down they come and they came off the um, elevator, uh, the two of them holding, holding hands in the middle of one walker. <laughs> As we walked through the um, through the hall to lunch, everyone came up to Catherine and greeted her. And she greeted them all by name and seemed to know everybody. Uh, she was the big cheese. She called bingo. She <laughs> led the, led the uh, uh, volunteers to the nursing home facility. Uh, and during lunch, she was asked to come to the podium for a phone call, and she went without the walker. And only halfway through lunch. Did Ward let me know that Catherine was sightless? Um, that had happened only a few years before. They had been together now for about seven years, both of them widowed. Uh, and she had gone in for an operation for macular degeneration, and the surgeon failed to notice the medication she was taking, so there was a hemorrhage, and she woke up functionally blind. I said, Catherine, did you sue the surgeon? She said, I never waste time on things I cannot change, which probably accounted a lot for her longevity. Uh, but it had then given Ward the opportunity to be even more vital in her life. He was kind of her radar. He would just put his hand on her back and kind of steer her, and, and she'd sort of give her the sense of who we were, they were about to meet, and so she would function as if she was completely sighted. Um, and so we went through the whole day together, uh, it was 8 o'clock in the evening. I was exhausted. They were still going strong. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, finally got up the nerve to ask the question, um, you know, do you have an intimate life? And Catherine said, oh, yes, very much so. She said, every night when Ward leaves, he gives me a big hug and I give him a big kiss. Uh, we don't have sex. We're not married. <laughs> But it didn't stop them uh, from being loving. Um, Ward told me that when Catherine was a little shaky, um, he would spend the night in her room in the recliner. Uh, and on other evenings, he arranged to have his apartment underneath hers so that if he heard her fall out of bed, he could rush right upstairs and bring her back into bed. 
and uh, we were they were expecting a hurricane that evening and I said gee do you mind living in a hurricane zone is it kind of scary and she said oh no it's really very interesting she said you know we were expecting Hurricane Ivan and so I went out and I got a sheer blue penoir and nightgown I thought I'd give war a shock <laughs> She said, but then the lights went out and we stuck our clothes. <laughs> well, I think their story uh, proves something that I feel very strongly about. Um, sex may be the last to go, but one thing never needs to go, and that is the only meaning that survives, which is love.